What if I told you that this small single panel right here holds more meaning than just a drunken old man? I don't know about you, but the last couple of One Piece chapters have gotten me really hyped. The recipe and ingredients for an upcoming epic clash are all laid out on the table, just waiting for Echiro Oda to cook. So this video is my attempt to add a little more spice to what is already brewing to be a very promising final saga of One Piece. And since we have a break week, I want to take you on a little deep dive into the recent chapters, so today we're going to be focusing on some key scenes, and I hope to enrich your experience and understanding of the story. And please let me know if you have any further thoughts on some of my observations, because while I really enjoy looking at the deeper meaning behind the words, panels, and scenes presented in the series, something I value even more is hearing fellow fans' interpretation of this wonderful series. The first is Kobe's reaction to Vegapunk's message. Kobe is shown still injured, reminiscing about about his conversation with Luffy about his dream as he listens to Vegapunk's message, to which he then vows to put an end to his friend and savior's dream. The very man that opened his own path to his dream of becoming a marine admiral. Here, Kobe shows the face of a determined man, which I have to say I love for his character. I know that this reaction and resolve came as a surprise and may have even seemed odd to a lot of readers. Why the sudden change in his demeanor towards Luffy? Why so serious? Why focus on Luffy and not others? like Blackbeard. I can't help but think that this really emphasizes we are now in the endgame. Kobe was one of the 12 main players that Oda included in that final double spread of chapter 1121. He is a key character for the final saga, so he needs to start acting like it. You don't get to the final saga just by making friends. Kobe also has to be serious in realizing his own goals and dreams. I think it's also important to consider the experiences that Kobe has recently faced that is likely to have shaped and changed him, he can't let Garp's sacrifice to go to waste. Garp's parting words was to bet on the new generation of marines, and if Kobe is going to live up to the hope and faith of his mentor, that means taking a serious stance against those who stand as the enemy of the marines. It's also possible that Kobe may have witnessed or come across something during his clash with Blackbeard and during his time at Fuller Lead that has further strengthened his resolve, but seeing as that's quite speculative, I'll leave it at that. Now whether he would actually be capable of stopping Luffy, which I think we can all agree is looking very unlikely considering how much stronger Luffy has become. But at least for now, this does add a necessary tension between him and Luffy, because although we have always predicted that the two would meet again as they promised each other, this time Kobe has more weight in going against Luffy. This isn't just Marineford Kobe helplessly trying to stop Luffy on the battlefield they shared simply to fulfill his duty. This is future Marine Admiral Kobe, determined to get in the way of Luffy getting to his dream. And it's crazy to think that in order for Kobe to achieve his goal, he must put an end to Luffy's, and for Luffy to get to the One Piece, the first friend that he made in his pirating journey, and the very first person he liberated, now stands in his way. And before we move on, if you want to be my friend in my YouTube journey, please subscribe to the channel to help me and not stand in my way of realizing my goal, my dreams and goal to reach 100k subscribers. I'd really appreciate appreciate it, and the faster we get to 100k, the faster I stop interrupting our discussions with these requests. Anyways, in chapter 1122, I also really like the juxtaposition in Buggy's scene here. In front of Buggy, his minions are enamored as always, but behind the scenes, we are shown the puppet masters who are actually pulling Buggy's strings. We actually witness this string pulling action right away with Crocodile ordering Buggy to sit down. And what I find quite funny was the angle from which which Oda drew both characters. Because upon my reread, I noticed that both of them were drawn so that we could only see the left side of their faces. But when you actually dissect this panel and the scene before, based on their respective positions in relation to each other, I think it would make more sense if we saw both of them turn to the right to face each other, but they're both drawn turning to the left. Now this could of course just be simply a mistake, but it's a mistake that's come about from Oda wanting to hammer in a point through the juxtaposition within the scene. Part of my enjoyment in reading One Piece is trying to dissect how Oda decides his choice of paneling, aka reading too much into things, and that's what we're going to do with this amazing double spread right here. There is so much history between these players that we have had the pleasure of witnessing, as well as the unfolding of history that we have to be excited about. And this is even before we start thinking about their respective crews or factions. The way that this spread has been presented, it's as if to make connections between the parallels that exist 
interacts between key characters, and these parallels exist on multiple levels. For now, let's just focus on the bottom eight characters. And first, let's consider this spread as each page being the mirror reflection of the other. This then presents us with intriguing relationship between characters that could potentially point to future matchups. Sabo and Sakazuki are placed in each of their respective pages' bottom outer corners, and if we consider their relationship, with Sakazuki being the one who executed Sabo's sworn brother, Ace, and Sabo now the user of his late brother's Mera Mera no Mi, of course, this sets up a clash between these two characters with a theme of vengeance. Will Sabo fall to Sakazuki like Ace did, or are we going to see Sabo, whose strength right now is likely to be equal to that of Ace had he lived? Will Sabo and his now much stronger use of the Mera Mera no Mi, combined with this added motivation, be enough to avenge his fallen brother? This for me is a very intriguing clash, especially when you add in that idea that Ace's growth and power and abilities had he lived would be similar to how strong Sabo is now. Ace and Sabo were presented to be equals in their youth, and the two brothers' battles with each other was always a coin toss. So should Sabo versus Sakazuki end with Sakazuki winning over Sabo, then this would open up a path for Luffy to be the one that defeats Sakazuki, which could also make sense because after all, he was the one who witnessed Ace's death after going through hell just to come up short. But we could also argue that Sabo not even getting the opportunity to try save Ace holds an equal value to Luffy's motivation. Sabo might even be placed in a situation where he feels like he cannot lose another brother and in his way is Sakazuki. Either way, I think the memory of Ace will likely play a part in the eventual defeat of Sakazuki, whether that be at the hands of Luffy or Sabo. Next is Dragon and Kuzan who are parallel to each other. The most obvious link being Garp. Dragon, who is Garp's son, strayed away from the path he once shared with his father because once a marine, Dragon is now on the opposite side. Whereas Kuzan, who was Garp's mentee, now also follows a different path, having become a pirate, joining the very same type of people he once swore to stop. Kuzan seemed to be the son that Garp never had, the one Garp was able to bond with during Kuzan's time as a marine, perhaps even more so than with his actual son. And this relationship between Dragon and Kuzan becomes even further messier when we remember that Kuzan fought Garp, actively opposing him in battle, perhaps even killing Garp, although I still maintain that's unlikely. So if Dragon and Kuzan are set to clash, Garp's ideologies and influences on both men will surely play a part. And who knows, perhaps even Garp himself will get embroiled in all of this. Next, we have Figurland Garling and a new mystery person. Popular speculations have been that this new figure is a God's Knight member or that he is otherwise connected to Shanks as a fellow Figurland. And if you want to hear more of my thoughts on who this mystery man is, then please watch this video that's on the top of your screen, but only after finishing this video. But regardless of who this man actually is, the significance of the Figurland family will more than likely be the central theme. Now looking at the inner two corners of the pages, very interestingly, Kobe and Imu represent the light and dark of the same faction. The Marines answer to the world government, who in turn answer to the one figure they consider to be the one true ruler of the world. In this way, this presents a conflict within Kobe's character and nature, centering around the idea of what is true justice. Kobe fights for justice. It's always been his dream to be a Marine, and not only that, Kobe wants to be a Marine Admiral. But the problem with Kobe's dream is that becoming a Marine Admiral would place him in direct contact and under the direct orders of the Celestial Dragons. An Admiral has to be more concerned about a Celestial Dragon's safety than that of the general populace. It's precisely the reason why Garp has rejected that position. It doesn't take a genius to know that this is something that also wouldn't sit well with Kobe's beliefs. So then, would Kobe, the epitome of the one true noble and good-willed marine in the series, still be willing to go after his dream if he finds out that he would be serving someone who is willing to eradicate an entire island of innocent people on a whim? But let's try dissecting the double spread another way. And then you can also contemplate the relationship between characters who are placed together on one page. For example, Sabo and Figurland Garling presents us with a former noble and current 
world noble, Kuzan and Kobe, similarly represent a former marine and current marine. Between Dragon and Sakazuki, we have another case of a former marine and the current head of marines. Even when the mystery character, will they represent two big unknowns, two silhouettes? It's also been pointed out to me that looking at just the bottom eight characters, on each page, we have each of the factions being represented. We have the revolutionaries via Sabo and Dragon. We've got marines through Kobe and Sakazuki. Celestial Dragon through Garling and Imu, and Kuzan is for now a pirate, suggesting that that mystery man may also be a pirate. And now time for the four emperors, and I've made a video focusing on these four alone because it deserves its own discussion, but let me go through it real quick because that video was made a while ago. Where do we even begin? These four men are tied together, their histories intertwining. Friends, foes, unlikely allies. Let's start with Luffy and Shanks, which has been the basis of many discussions, and rightly so because because this is a prominent and critical relationship in the story. Shanks is Luffy's hero and role model, who played a major part in how Luffy views pirate life, and to some extent, the world at large. Luffy made a promise to Shanks that the next time they see each other, he will become a great pirate, which he arguably already is. After all, Luffy defeated an emperor like Shanks, and now stands on equal status with him, being one of the four emperors himself. But the implication in that promise was that Luffy would become the Pirate King. Now, there is a popular theory that Shanks is in fact evil and will be one of Luffy's opponents, but there's no real solid evidence within the series that points to this being the case. We've seen that Shanks is fond of Luffy and vice versa, so this theory that Shanks is a big baddie who will turn on Luffy isn't something I personally subscribe to, but I can't deny it's at least an entertaining idea that would make for an intriguing reunion. However, even if not ill-willed, it's not out of the question that these two might actually clash, but the basis for such a clash would likely be so that it's a measure of how strong Luffy has grown, and for Luffy to prove to Shanks that he has now fulfilled his promise. But after a quick clash, considering the relationship presented between Luffy and Shanks, an alliance between the two is more than likely to happen. Either way, Luffy versus Shanks, or Luffy side by side with Shanks as they battle a common foe, they're both welcome options centering around the theme of goals and promises. But you want a surefire, inevitable clash filled with bad blood? Look no further than Shanks vs Blackbeard. This confrontation is one for the ages. You could argue that none of the combinations between these emperors have as rich of a history as Shanks and Blackbeard. These two will always be tied to each other. I mean, Oda couldn't even draw one without the other in any of the volume covers they've appeared in. Seriously, here are all the volume covers they've appeared in. Crazy, right? These two have been fighting since they were apprentices, and the history between them could make for an interesting series on its own. But for now, I'll settle for witnessing that becoming uncovered in our current story. Shanks, for the most part, is a pretty chill dude. He was friendly enough when meeting with a fellow emperor, initially at least, and was even friendly with his old swordsman rival, albeit after he found out Mihawk just wants to talk to him about Luffy and not duel him. But the point is that Shanks doesn't generally take things to heart. That's the basis of his character, shown since his first interaction with Higuma. Friendly and easygoing, initially initially at least, until of course he threatened Luffy. So when we take all of that into account, Shanks is happy when there's good news about his friends, but gets pretty intimidating when you threaten them. So seeing him always putting on a serious face when it comes to Blackbeard tells you all you need to know about how Shanks views him. There is a deep-rooted dark history behind Shanks' scar he received at the hands of Blackbeard, and we know how Oda uses scars as an important and symbolic element of a character's design. For example, Luffy's scar is a reminder of his own inadequacies and shortcomings, an injury burnt through beyond the physical surface. Shanks' scar serves the same purpose in his journey, a constant reminder of a moment of weakness against Blackbeard. Will their eventual clash show that Shanks has now learned from this mistake? Or will Blackbeard once again gain an upper hand on Shanks? When it comes to Blackbeard and Buggy, Blackbeard is probably just pissed off at Buggy for gossiping about his inability to sleep and just wants to beat Buggy up, but upon closer look, these two have some intriguing similarities and contrasts. Buggy's morality is closer to that of Blackbeard. Although not being entirely evil, or at least not as evil as Blackbeard, this is arguably only due to the fact that he isn't as powerful as Blackbeard in terms of sheer combat ability. But Blackbeard could be seen as who Buggy would have been had he obtained a similar power. Both cheated in their ways of obtaining their devil fruit. Buggy pretended to eat his, planning initially to sell it, but then accidentally consumed it 
showing us he had no desire to be a devil fruit user because he didn't want to lose his ability to swim. Whereas Blackbeard, on the other hand, chased after the devil fruit he desired, welcoming the danger that comes with consuming two devil fruits. Each has his own charm and a unique way of influencing those around them. Buggy through misunderstandings and Blackbeard through pure understanding on how to manipulate every situation in his rise to power. While you might argue that a confrontation between the two would easily result with Blackbeard's domination, I think we've seen enough of Buggy's luck to know that he could find a way to even out the playing field against anyone, including Blackbeard. Or at least that's how it would seem in the naked eye of those who worship him. Buggy's inclusion as one of the centerpieces in this race for the One Piece is something I thoroughly enjoy. Because of his relationship to both Luffy and Shanks, Buggy is a wild card, a great character that is waiting to settle on his shade. He was an apprentice at the same time as Shanks and Blackbeard, and was a part of the pirate era that created many legends, and in a funny way, seems to be guided by fate just like Luffy. So no matter which way you look at it, these characters are so interlinked and share important history. And it's truly a testament to the many years of storytelling that Oda has been able to craft such intriguing, deep-rooted relationships between so many combinations of figures. And this sets up plenty of interesting interactions to look forward to, and when that time comes, we One Piece fans will eat. Because wherever we look, there will be history, depth, and I'm sure plenty of badass clashes for those of you who find pleasure in the fisticuffs in this great series. Now, as a bonus for those of you who enjoys reading into things as much as I do, what if I told you that this small single panel right here holds more meaning than just a drunken old man. After witnessing him drunkenly berate Vegapunk for spoiling the world secrets in chapter 1116, we see Rayleigh here passed out from all his drinking. On one hand, considering the guy's just drunk himself to sleep, drinking alone for that matter, this could be interpreted as being slightly depressing. He's one of the unfortunate people who has lived on and aged, now only able to reminisce about his days as a pirate and the good times he shared with his friends, instead of going going out a warrior's way like his legendary contemporaries. This can also be interpreted as Rayleigh finally resting and closing the chapter of the old generation to make way for the new generation. As he remembers Roger's final words, we are witnessing one of the last prominent remnants of the Pirate King's generation finally being able to rest. And what's the scene we see right after? A group of pirates' dreams further ignited and the new generation's race for the One Piece is truly underway. It's looking like Echiro Oda is working to be true to his words in 2012 when he said that the final saga of One Piece will make Marineford look cute in comparison. Taking that at face value and with Marineford primarily being a battleground with only minimal lore, one could assume that Oda is currently working towards another Clash of the Titans, but this time with the added goodness of all the lore, the character buildups and relationships finally coming to a head. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into recent events. If you did, then make sure to let me know by leaving a comment and liking this video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. You can also join these wonderful people by becoming a channel or Patreon member. And I do want to thank you lovely people for your support. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.